here at the gallery. And Alice Meyer, right back there, the owner of Beaverdale Books, who has books available for sale and signing after the presentation. Deb Klein's heart-wrenching and soul-giving true story offers a love letter to kindred, incest, and rape survivors, a guidebook to those who love and care for them, and a powerful, vicarious experience to help us all empathize with the plight of one in four girls and one in six boys. Her story has been described as devastating, perceptive, yet life-affirming, exposing the intimate damage of trauma while embodying a triumphant human spirit. Deb has been the owner and operator of Wellspring Wellness, LLC, since 2006, and she became a published author in 2020 with her book, Forgetting to Remember, A Healer's Journey of Surviving and Thriving. Music, poetry, dance, and art, her heart's compositions, became her healing balm. Today, she is committed to raising awareness and funding for agencies aiding recovery from sexual abuse and childhood trauma via her book, music, and art. So please join me in welcoming Deb Klein. Thank you. So I'm going to do a little bit of music, a little bit of book reading, and um, I want—I just want to thank everyone for coming, and also just I'm so grateful to be on the other side of this journey and sharing with you. And I want everyone to know that um, what I share today is no longer traumatic for me. And so it's a gift of healing that I offer. I'm going to start with um, a song called Who I Am, because it honors uh, both kind of the, um, the trauma, but also the good parts of my growing up years. And so we'll start off with a both and story, Who I Am. Yes. 
So the first story I want to share um, is from the um, oh, it's from page fifty. It's the second chapter in the book, and this is the part that you probably recommended that I share. <laughs> Mom's voice trails down the hallway. I can hear that she's changing the sheets on my bed and still threatening my dad. You're lucky that the bleeding stopped. This will never happen again, never, dad mumbles in agreement as she continues. And we will never mention this ever again. We're all going to forget this ever happened. That's all I remember about that night. I don't remember getting out of the tub or getting back into bed or falling back to sleep. I do remember something from the next day. Mom is in the kitchen. She is scrubbing my bed sheet from the night before in the kitchen sink that she spilled with soapy water. Most of the sheet, white with purple flowers, billows onto the floor, still dry. The top sheet and pillowcases are also crumpled on the floor. I'm just going to get this stain out before I wash your sheets. She explains to me with a half smile. She put the matching set with pink flowers on my bed last night. I only have two sets of sheets that are designated for my bed. The white with pink roses ones are identical, except in flower color, to the white with purple roses ones. The part of the purple pattern sheet that now soaks in the sink has my brown blood droplets on it. No matter how much she frantically scrubs, she can't get the stains to disappear. Eventually, she accidentally wears a hole through the sheet, which frustrates her further. In a huff and a whirl, Mom wads the sheet into a ball, letting the water splash out of the sink onto the floor. She scoops up the top sheet and pillowcases from the floor and wrestles the floral tangle into her arms, dripping all the while through the kitchen out the back door and outside to the alleyway garbage cans. I trail behind her. She doesn't bother to bag up the linen refuse, but tosses it as is into a bin and slams down the lid. The end result is that I no longer have my favorite sheets, the ones covered in purple roses. A week or so later, later it is sheets laundering day in our house. My mom always launders all the bed sheets together, and once the beds are stripped and the washing machine has started with the first load, she busies herself with remaking all of our beds with fresh sheets from the linen closet. On this particular day, I am helping her. Mom stares, blinking at the open linen closet, and then asks me, where are your purple sheets? I don't know what to say to her. I watched her try to scrub them clean, tear a hole in them, and throw them away. We were both there when it happened. She continues, I don't understand why they aren't here. Where have they gone to? Don't you remember, Mom? I try to jog her memory. You threw them away? Don't be silly, Deborah. Why would I throw away a set of perfectly good sheets? Mom's obliviousness disturbs me. I offer further, they had a stain you couldn't scrub out and you tore a hole in them. That's why you threw them away, they were ruined. Remember? She keeps blinking at me with a blank, eerie expression as if she can't make out what I am saying. No, that can't be right, she seems flustered. Are you telling me you threw your sheets away, Deborah? No, Mom, I didn't throw them away. You did. I punctuate the truth. Then I stomp off down the stairs away from her, frustrated, mad, and confused. Really, Mom, you're going to accuse me of something that you yourself did? Why don't you remember? I wasn't going to elaborate further about how the stain got there in the first place. It was unbelievable. Was she really so clueless? So this song I'm going to play is um, on page nine, and it's the introduction, or the poem right before the introduction. And this song is called Listen to Me. Do you know what the little girl 
is from chapter 6, The Heart of the Musician, starting on page, um, let's see, where is it? On 105. In seventh grade, I changed piano teachers. My new instructor, Mrs. Snyder, lives in the neighborhood near my junior high school, so one day a week, I skipped the bus, school bus ride home and walked to her house. The music is getting advanced enough that I start missing notes, a lot of them. Mrs. Snyder doesn't play any of my lesson pieces for me upon first sight like Mrs. Carson did. I struggle to read the notes on the page at home on my own, but too many notes are to be played simultaneously and in quick succession. Block chords with four notes in the bass clef, not my fingers, and frustrate my ear, wrenching my heart. I stop practicing my lesson music and start making up more solos that are fun and tickle my ear, enlivening my heart. When mom hears me playing the piano at home, she thinks I'm practicing my lesson music. Instead, I know I'm cheating. My piano teacher finally gets fed up with my abysmal attempts at playing my lesson repertoire and calls my mom. She asks if I've been practicing. Mom answers, yes, I sound great at home. 
Mrs. Snyder arranges for mom to attend my next lesson. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm anxious as I arrive with my mother at my piano teacher's door, tightly clutching my piano books to my chest. As we enter, the two grown-ups exchange pleasantries and again confirming that I'm practicing at home every day for at least 30 minutes. Mrs. Snyder pulls up a chair for my mom by the upright piano next to hers. I slump myself on the bench and open the lesson book to my first piece, dreading what I know will be an atrocious performance at best. I fix my eyes to the notes on the page, but all my brain sees is a foreign language of ink spots. My fingers strike one key after the other, awkwardly tripping over each other, staggering and landing on one clunker after another in an endless, obnoxious cacophony of keyboard swears. Kerplunk, clunk clankity, plonk, plank clonk. I completely murder the piece of music and were the composer not already dead, my rendition would surely have killed him. <laughs> Mom stares at me dumbfounded and confused. That's not the song you've been practicing at home. Play for her what you've been practicing, Mom insists. So this is what I was practicing. It's called Reflections. Forgetting to remember chapter 13, named after the book, um, and it starts on page 244. For our first apartment, my husband and I purchased an upright piano I found advertised for $50 in the classified ads. Playing my old compositions was still a balm for me. I'd leave the world behind temporarily between PTSD symptoms and waves of remembering. In my early 30s, when I finally pulled together all of the trauma memories, I began composing again, but the creative process was different. My melodies surged, urgent and pressing. New music came pouring through me. New lyrics came from somewhere and attached themselves to those notes. Whether I wanted to or not, I began to process my pain through songwriting. Or maybe I should say that the creative Creativity poured through me, like a tidal wave of feverish obsession or a waterfall of crazed possession, with me as a mere conduit for the songs being written by the waters flooding through me. Back in college, I wrote Four Walls, and I didn't fully understand.
understand what it was about. I knowingly felt like depression was my cage, holding both me and the shadow monster so I could never escape. Each time I sang the song, the first line and a later phrase I wrote never made sense to me. I'm hiding in these four walls that are myself, that I built to keep them out. How can I construct a cage so cruel, almost as bad as what they did to me? Who were them and they? Them and they turned out to be my rapists. When I wrote it, I could feel the four walls, even though I didn't have conscious access to the seven-year-old or the 13-year-old trapped within them. It turned out that the song was about so much more. My 13-year-old captive must have written both the music and the lyrics back then. Four walls. This um, next excerpt is from Anger My Superpower, that chapter. And I'm going to start reading on page 260. By the time I finished it, enraged, my angriest piano song had channeled my power with a rush of force. But to start, I slumped over the keyboard, heavy hearted. Dredging up my buried rage was like digging up a grave, excavating layers of grief, examining the decayed remains. I scribbled words in my spiral-bound notebook before touching an ivory key. A pattern emerged of four couplet phrases with a triplet at the end. He'll flee from the danger he claims doesn't exist. He'll flee from the anger he claims doesn't exist. He'll get off with a slap on the wrist. He'll get off with a yank of his wrist. What are you running from? What are you hiding from? Don't you deny me my rage. My doodling fingers fleshed out some D minor chord progressions in a rhythmic 6-8 time with the running bass line of a tippy carnival ride. The voiced melody rose on its own, a solo above the chords. 
The first four lines became the first verse, while the triplet naturally divided itself from the rest and, by adding repetitions, became the bridge and chorus. What are you running from? repeated, as did, what are you hiding from? Together, forming the bridge, leaving a triply repeated chorus to cast a spell of don't you deny me my rage. So, enraged, you've been forewarned. <laughs> chapter, I'm going to read the poem that um, introduces that chapter called Hazel's Lamp that I wrote in college. And then I'm going to follow it with a song that I wrote for my great grandma in high school shortly after she passed away. And both represent the words that she said to me on her deathbed. Hazel's Lamp. Spotlight, center stage, with spirit I fly, casting shadows of my own, just one. I am one with the light, song of my own being, making the stage fly with my spirit. The audience has spirit that is one with me. They fly into the light to share my stage, yet each on their own. No one can own your spirit, Hazel said. Your stage is the one to light your way, so fly, fly on your own toward the light so your spirit can be one with you off stage. 
Hazel reached that stage where she needed to fly. I was the only one she told of coming to her own, of how her spirit danced in the light. Now I am on my own and seek her spirit, her light. This is called Grandma's Promise. songs. This one, Joyride, was a song before it was a chapter in my book. And I'll just tell you that this song is a healing anthem for me. But this is what led up to this song. I scale over the wheel well and then steady my stance, standing at the ready in the bed of the truck. As I reach out my arms to retrieve the bike, the person called Dwayne thrusts my bike into my chest like a battering ram, knocking me back off my feet. I land with a hard thud butt first on metal ridges and see my bike sailing midair into the grassy ditch. 
Dwayne jumps in the cab, yelling, go, 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 we got her. The pickup tires squeal as if peeling away from a crime scene. I try to right myself, but the erratic driver veers and zigzags and keeps me tumbling precariously in the open carriage. I grasp the metal edge with both hands and peer over at the pavement speeding by. The truck is zooming too fast for me to jump. I look through the rear cab window and on through the windshield. They're heading into the park. My mind panics at the thought of being taken across state lines. I'm being kidnapped, I think. The other park entrance is close to two other state borders. I worry that if they drive me across state lines, I may never see my family again. My God, are they taking me to Texas? My brain swirls, trying rapidly to translate what is happening. Okay, don't panic. The next time they slow down, just jump and run. I catch the face of the middle guy staring back at me. He looks terrified. I'm not sure why. I'm the one being kidnapped, not him. I hear incoherent words flying out the open windows that sound like an argument. I strain to hear what they are saying, but can't. Between the music and the muffler and the wind whooshing past my ears, any attempts to decipher their banter is useless. I repeat my plan. Jump and run, jump and run. When they slow down, just jump and run. Slowing down comes sooner than I think. Why did they pull into a dead end overlook? No time to wonder. Jump and run. I do. I dash towards back towards the main road in an adrenaline sprint. Gosh, she's getting away, Dwayne's voice screeches. Another voice cracks. Just let her go. I don't want to. Not like this. It must be the middle seat guy, the one who looked terrified staring back at me through the window as I was trapped in the swerving open cage. My escape doesn't last long. The driver, Carrie Grant, otherwise known as Gus, easily overtakes me saying, oh no you don't, where do you think you're going? As he grabs me around the waist from behind, he plucks me off my feet with one arm as easily as picking up a rag doll. This is the song version.
our anthem. Yes. So this next passage is also from the chapter, um, The Heart of the Musician, page 107. My favorite teacher at Cooper Junior High School in seventh and eighth grade is, hands down, Mr. Crown. He is as enthusiastic for the love of teaching as he is for the love of his students. Fun-spirited, but also no-nonsense. He can crack a corny joke as quickly as he can cast the teacher's stink eye. Both are just to get us squirrely adolescents to pay attention. Of course, he just happens to teach my favorite subjects as well. Music, choir, musical theater, and guitar. We played ukulele in sixth grade music class and I had a blast. So when I saw guitar would be offered in eighth grade, I signed up right away. Mr. Crown has guitars we can use at school and we can even check one out to practice lessons at home. I quickly adapt to tuning the guitar and playing the first few series of simple chord progressions. For one entire class period, we practiced a strumming style I still use today. Down, down, up, up, down, up. In a syncopated 4-4 four, four time. He makes us say it with him as he demonstrates and we strum along. Down is the quarter note on beat one. Down up is two eighth notes, beats two and. And up, down up, three eighth notes after the eighth rest and the downbeat of three, strum strumming on beats and four and. This is why I can still effortlessly repeat the saying and the motion in my sleep. Did I mention we practiced the strumming for an entire class period and then reviewed it briefly on other days? Down, down, up, up, down, up, down, down, up, up, down, up. Like my study of the piano, I start making up guitar chord progressions with hummed melody lines. In addition to strumming the chords, Mr. Crown teaches us some arpeggio string plucking patterns. From there, I construct a melancholy lullaby without words. And like my original piano songs, it soothes the ever growing shadow monster into submission. I dub it the hummed lullaby. The title and lyrics to this song don't come right away, not until I've more than doubled my age. So this is called Waiting for Rain. But in the spirit of the 14 year old who made up this song, I'm going to hum the first line, the first verse. And I think she wrote these words as well, just many, many years later.
for you that are more of the uplifting nature. Um, my own personal spirituality um, is something that also helped me to heal. And so um, this song is called Mirror. Its first two lines are the poem um, on page, I guess on page 93 of chapter 5. The chapter is called What's Wrong With Me? <laughs> and when I use it out of context from the song, um, it represents that time in my life when it was really hard to look in the mirror. And with this song, I've reclaimed looking in the mirror and not just seeing the physical me, the entire universe reflected back at me. This is called Mirror.
piece in me, the chorus of it is the poem that introduces the apt word on page 327. <clears throat> And then after the song, we'll do a little Q and A. <clears throat> So I'm Callie Van Bali. I'm an area um, writer and creative writing pre professor, and I often do um, author events for Be Real Books and help moderate some of the Q and A sections. Um, so I read Deb's book and also visited with her on Zoom a little bit about it. So we're just going to close out the evening with a few questions for for you about the book and some of your creative process and some of the other things you're into. Um, so as I, as Jan was saying in your introduction, um, your book, it's, it's very brave, it's an important book, um, and I first wanted to ask you how you finally decided to write your story. What, what gave you the courage to finally put the words down on paper? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a week before all the COVID stuff came crashing down, that's when I decided, okay, I have something to say, I'm going to write it. And keep in mind, I am more than 15 years away from my full circle healing. 
And so I'm, I'm really not sure. It's just like, you know, I just get these downward messages sometimes. It's like, you're going to write a book. Like, am I? I guess I am. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, of course, with COVID and everything shutting down, I had to close my wellness business. And it's like, boy, I have a lot of time to write. <laughs> and I think that COVID time also gave me permission to write about my family when I didn't have to see them and to um, explore a deeper layer of healing by telling the story so that someone else could understand it. Um, and I don't know that I could have necessarily done that as well as I was also offering healing to others. Mm -hmm. I think it really worked well for me to just be able to, you know, focus on just the book writing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so six weeks I had a rough draft. Diane was gracious enough to read it. She said, you have two books here. Decide which one you want to write. I decided on the memoir. And so I wrote a second draft and she recommended me to write. Uh, a publisher. So, yeah. So in the, in the first part of the memoir, you use this really interesting structure where you call you have found you call them found memories and then always memories. Forgotten memories. Forgotten memories. Forgotten memories. And FM always and always memories. AM. AM. How did you come up with that structure? <laughs> How did you decide on that? AM and FM. It's kind of already been, always been stuck in my head because um, my dad was a he was a radio guy. And he would sometimes, um, he worked at the radio station and sometimes they were short people so he'd have to read the weather on air. <laughs> and we'd have to make sure we turned the dial to the right, you know, we couldn't have it, we had to have it on FM to hear again, but we usually listened to the AM station, or it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I was trying to think about how, how do you explain to people, you know, this was something I'd forgotten about and this is something I've always remembered. And that AM FM just kind of popped in my head one day, and I was like, oh, it's like tuning into a radio. You know, it's either AM, always memory, FM, forgotten memory. And that's how, you know, I just it just kind of came to me mm -hmm. as a an idea and it worked. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, with the, the the events that you write about in this book, I was really curious how you took care of yourself while you were writing it and ultimately reliving all these. Well, these tra or these um, traumatic incidents. How did you take care of yourself while you were? Because um, writing, you have to really dig in and <laughs> yeah, put the words to describe precise moments, and that of course had to have been hard. So, how did you take care of yourself during the process? Um, I did, you know, kind of re-open some of those feelings, and I think because I'd already healed it. The first time, I knew it was time to just take a bath. I knew it was time to have, spend a day in bed and not look at my book today. I knew, um, you know, I knew when I was angry and agitated, that's not what it was about. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. about anything in my immediate environment. It was like, okay, and Kendall can attest to that. <laughs> um, but I, I think because I had already come full circle in my healing and I had that nice 15 plus year window it gave me enough perspective to be able to understand, okay, I'm experiencing this. It has nothing to do with what's going on in my life right now. And I can put this on paper and I can send it off to the publisher and hopefully she won't send it back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there did come a point though when we were in the editing process and we were doing chapter three, the Joyride chapter, and that was the hardest one to write. And my, my publisher made the mistake or the good fortune of telling my book was good enough as is and we could just tweak it some. <laughs> so I took the liberty of reminding her of that when I said, you know, you're editing my book, I'm editing my trauma and I need to be done with this chapter. And it's, so then we moved on. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I never even thought about that in, in editing, going over and over revising or, or mm -hmm. tweaking sentences would be forcing the author to keep in a certain way in a yeah certain way. yeah oh, wow. and at one point i was like this is good enough yeah. <laughs> i think they get the point was there ever a moment you had a second thought about writing the book mm -hmm. no no it was like i said it was just kind of this download it was like i just wrote it it was there and then i had you know material to work with 
and you know to tweak and to refine it and have good readers giving me good feedback of you know what fits and what doesn't and so no I, I never had second thoughts about um, telling my story and sharing it although when it first came out there's a part in the book where I um, talk about I accidentally let the secret spill. I'm not supposed to say um, special game. And I get in this argument with my mom and I say something about the special game and I'm like, Ooh. I felt exactly the same way when my book was first released on Amazon. I was like, I wasn't supposed to tell. And I did feel that same angst, but I recognized what it was. I knew it was that little girl inside going, I don't know about this. Um, but within a couple of weeks, it was like, I got so much positive feedback. It was like, it, I knew it was the right thing to do. And that little part of me was, had more pride than, than fear. Yeah. Yeah. What advice can you give anyone else who's thinking about trying to write about their own traumatic story? Get a really good publisher. <laughs> um, I would recommend... And this is my process, you know, it's, it's like if you can write anything down, you know, write it down. But at the same time, like I said, I had this 15 year grace period and distance from it. I was not in the throes of my own healing when I was writing. And it was, you know, it was an, you know, an always memory by then. <laughs> and so I think I did try to write at other times and I think I was still too caught up in my own grief about it to give it the um the balanced perspective that it deserved yeah yeah so i have one last question but if anyone else wants to jump in with a question too please do um do you have any new art projects you're working on right now <laughs> um not really i mean this one woman show so to speak <laughs> this is my new thing i want to take it on the road and share with as many people as possible um you know i have other songs i have you know other parts of my book i can read but i really want to spread healing mm. because i feel like i have the good fortune of being able to be on the other side of this awful thing and i want people to know that there is another side that it is really awful but if you keep plugging away and keep going there is a time and space where you can talk about your trauma and it's like talking about the weather. Mm -hmm. And I never thought that would happen. Mm -hmm. I never thought I would get to a point where I could share so openly and publicly. Mm -hmm. When I first wrote my songs, I didn't share them with anyone. They were too precious to share. It was like, oh my gosh, this little baby. But then it's like the baby grew up and it's like, well, of course I should share. <laughs> but then again, it's kind of this unique thing. It's like, well, how would you like to listen to my rape song? You know? <laughs> I have this wonderful, beautiful incest song. Would you like to hear it? Um, it's a specific audience geared thing. And so that's why I think advocating in this way, you know, with people that are healing, with people that are helping people that are healing, um, it's, it's kind of like the only way I see forward with yeah. my book and my music. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Deb? What's been your experience in sharing your story and your road show? Do people come up to you with their stories? I haven't really had anyone come up to me with their own stories yet. Um, most of the people that have come up to me are people that I know, and if they have a story, I kind of already know it because they're my friend. Mm -hmm. And I, I have had people to say thank you for putting you know some different things in a context that I hadn't thought about. It might help me heal more. Um, and I have got a lot of feedback about it offering hope to people that mm -hmm. you know are stuck in the middle. Yeah. Um, but I haven't yet. I look forward to. You know, hearing from people that I don't know. But like I said, for you know, I wrote the book, and then there was still another year of COVID. This is my second event. Really? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah, I had one at Dogger Books at the beginning of the month. This is my second event, and so we'll keep plugging away and going. I just hope it builds from here. I wasn't going to say anything, but because you hope to hear from somebody. <laughs> This experience, you kept looking at me like you knew. Uh, 
uh, you know, in my lifetime, uh, you know, incest, an uncle, and, uh, you know, I was five and six and seven mm -hmm. years of age. And um, what was additionally difficult about it is that I shared with my mother with the only words I could figure out to share what was happening and and why she should not let him get, get me into the bedrooms. And she didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, embarrassed, it was her. Brother-in-law, life at the, te the party, very funny guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I'd run out in front of a car, she would have grabbed me. But not this. Yeah. Uh, you understand why you don't talk about it. And you don't even acknowledge that it's happening. And that's, that's part of why I wanted to write the book too, is because it is taboo still. It's like, mm -hmm. why is it the whistleblowers mm -hmm. that are always shunned? Don't be a tattletale. Yeah. You know, it's like, why do we encourage that in our culture? We have this patriarchal kind of um, culture that allows for um, victimization to happen. And it is treated like an embarrassment to everyone except the perpetrator. <laughs> How does that happen? It's like everyone protects the perpetrator because in protecting the perpetrator, you don't have to acknowledge all that ucky yucky stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, it's ucky yucky stuff. Yeah. And I'm so sorry well, that happened to you as well. Well, you know, as you've introduced it, one out of four. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's so harmfully prevalent. And uh, so, you know, talking about it and singing about it and what the poetry, and it's very, very helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you came. Um, well, any other questions? There are copies of Beck's book available. Beaverdale Books is here selling them tonight. I've read it. It's a wonderful, really important book. And this was this was such a fascinating evening, Beck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. donation books if you want to buy one for Iowa Casa then they will be able to give those books to their clients their staff um, and so if you want to buy a book for them that would be great too and they still get the nine dollars they get the nine dollars and the book um, an ongoing thing that Alice is doing for me at Beaverdale Books is anytime someone buys that book in the store nine dollars goes to Iowa Casa oh, so send your friends that way <laughs> let them know that's true Thank you for doing that.